Welcome to another episode of Zeroing In. I'm Naman Jain and hosting this episode with me today is KV and G Vikram who recently graduated from IIST with a master's in earth system sciences. Our guest for today is a scientist who works in the field of atmospheric sciences and meteorology. He pursued his master's in meteorology from the Cochin University of Science and Technology then moved to conduct his doctoral work in atmospheric science at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur. His further research work was carried out at the University of Oklahoma following which he joined the current position at the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology in 2014 and is currently an associate professor there. He has worked on elaborate ideas in meteorology with research primarily focusing on the study and impact of data assimilation on the performance of weather models, atmospheric dynamics and predictability and climatology. tracking forecast of tropical cyclones and indian monsoons to name a few broad directions while these fields can be understood to be quintessentially non trivial at the onset the entailing work encapsulates a plethora of details that makes the understanding of the field and the take away from it extremely riveting at its very core while also being singularly relevant to the everyday lives of the whole living community at large In our conversation with him, we discovered about his journey and explored the diverse field of atmospheric sciences, climatology, and meteorology, and all that it entails from a scientific perspective, with an intriguing touch to the everyday ideas which it imparts. That seems to be the pressing points of our generation's concerns for the future. A very warm welcome to Dr. Govindan Kutti Mohan Kumar. Very good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to the session. We're really glad to have you, sir. We begin with the discussion usually with the idea about the beginnings and how uh, your formative years have been, uh, as you remember them. Are there any peculiar ideas or stories uh, that you recall from your early years? Yeah, uh, after completing my schooling, I was actually clueless what to do after that. I was from a village background, and there was no proper guidance to give me. My parents always encouraged me to study a lot, but uh, I don't know which direction I should move. Some of my school teachers had advised me to go for physics. I completed three years of my physics, but at least some portions of the physics are so scary for me. I still remember my professor writing down the Schrodinger equation on the blackboard, and I was—it was so scary for me. So I, I thought this is not my track. This is physics that will not work with me. But I don't know what to do next. So I was, in fact, you know, looking out for different options. I discussed with my professors in my university. One professor told me that so we have a project which has to be done at the final semester of my bachelor of science. So he said that why don't you go to IMD? So IMD is close by. So why can't we go and can do some project on atmospheric science, or you can go and collect some data from the IMD and you can work on it. So that was as a revelation to me. Okay, so this is something different. So I just went over there. I just collected some data, do did some data analysis. It was some some trivial work. So I just uh, got excited with this, and then I looked for options to study more on the subject. So then I found that Cochin University is actually offering courses on atmospheric science for the people who are having the physics background. But you have to qualify at an entrance exam. So I wrote the entrance exam and I qualified that. Once I joined, I realized that you know physics is not leaving me; it is actually running behind me. Uh, so this subject is not far from physics. But this physics actually comforts me. This I, I'm okay with the classical mechanics. But if you ask me to have an abstract thinking and all this, I'm a bit scared. So this physics, which is mostly dealing with the you know classical mechanics regime, was okay with me. Okay, uh, but then when was it that you decided to move into research, or uh, did you have a hint that probably research was a field for you? Uh, when I was doing my final years of my project in MSc, I did some work on Indian Ocean dipole, a certain phenomenon which is forming, and the, how it affects the Indian climate. So I got some significant result with that. That actually excited me. So I thought, okay, I'm I'm not bad at research. After that, I went for some cruises, which actually collected data from Arabian Sea. Uh, so it was like several day cruise. So we have been given certain coordinates. When the ship reaches this particular coordinate, it may be at midnight, say twelve o'clock, one o'clock. So you have to set an alarm. You have to wake up. You have to you know 
put this instrument in the sea and get collect the data as well. So I was actually assisting a, a, a research scholar there. So all these things and the, my project and all these cruises and all these things, I, I got excited with it. So I, I, I'm sure that I'm going to pursue research with that. But I decided that I will do research only if I got admitted to either some you know foreign universities or uh, some premier institutes in India. So I searched for the options, then I found that CSR is the MHRD uh, exam, which uh, if you qualify it, you will get uh, five years in uninterrupted grant. I qualified that, and at that time, getting the CSR is a very rare thing for people. And once you get CSR, it is very easy to get into premier institute. And IIT Kharagpur, we are actually in physics department. And I joined there. So I realized that, uh, that I have to work on numerical modeling of atmosphere, which means like we have all these dynamical equations which is governing the sphere. So you have to write or you have to you know solve these equations numerically to predict the future of the atmosphere. So the problem which is given to me is, is that these numerical models are very sensitive to its initial conditions. So this is based on the theory of chaos, which is uh, from Lorentz butterfly effect and all these things which you might have heard of. Like a flap of butterfly wing in Brazil could generate a tornado in Texas. So this means that nonlinear dynamical systems are very sensitive to initial conditions. The numerical models which predicts the atmosphere cannot be accurate just because of the sensitivity to its initial conditions. So the job which is assigned to me is to generate some mathematical models to improve these initial conditions. That method is what we call as data station. So we use all the satellite observations and all and develop some uh, you know, mathematical techniques which improves the initial conditions, which further improves the forecast. This can be then used by operational weather centers. I, I worked on this uh, data simulation systems from almost like 2006 to 2010. Uh, and I evaluated this with respect to the forecast of tropical cyclones, which is forming over uh, Bay of Bengal, monsoon depressions, etc. So to how well my, my method works. Okay, then uh, how does that translate further to your later works? Did you wait and explore other ideas or how was your transition to further research positions and the experiences there? Uh, interestingly, the day I had my defense, the same day I got the offer letter in University of Oklahoma. Actually, it is not in University of Oklahoma. It is a National Weather Center. It is a federal building where there is a center for analysis and prediction of storm. So that's a very famous center. They make a lot of models. Uh, I got an offer letter from the, from the CAPS. So I left for US. I did my postdoc for almost like three and a half years there. This National Weather Center is located in Norman. Once I reached there, I understood that this is a tornado alley. You will see like 50 to 60 tornadoes every year. So that was in fact another scary experience for me, <laughs> apart from Schrodinger equation. The problem with tornadoes is that tropical cyclones or hurricanes, what you say, is forming over the oceans and days before we can see which direction the uh, hurricane is proceeding. But tornadoes are not like that. So and this place is the, the hot spot of tornadoes. Uh, you, you can always predict the probability of forming of tornadoes tomorrow but where exactly it is going to happen and when exactly it is going to happen is very difficult to that's why the tornadoes are very unpredictable and very dangerous i have seen that uh, it can in fact cause a lot of destructions to the buildings and a lot of deaths in that region uh, during april may is uh, the season in which usually the tornadoes form that was one of the scariest experience for me I've also seen the students and uh, teachers sometimes there are storm chasers you, you might have seen the movie twister where uh, these people actually follow the storms, they will put the sensors and the track of the uh, tornadoes and if the tornadoes hit that place, they will get a lot of valuable information. They can publish papers with that. So those kind of, you know, adventurous things were also happening. I was so scared. I, I'll never go for this adventurous sort of thing. I'm not, I'm not fit for that. So, but I have, those, these are all, you know, very new experiences for me, you know, people who are following tornadoes and all those things. And uh, before the formation of tornadoes, you will see all this uh, sets, uh, different types of clouds like mematis clouds, like hanging from. So when you see that, you it's, it's an alarming situation. Okay, you have to be very careful. This uh, we have seen this type of cloud, so a possibility of uh, forming a tornado over there is there. So then we will rush to the uh, shelters and all this. So those are you know very interesting experience I had in uh, in uh, Norman and we have in National Weather Center. We had a cafeteria and the name of the cafeteria is very interesting. It is called Flying Cow Cafe. So, so I asked why this name? Oh, it's a weird name, right? Flying Cow Cafe. And they have a, uh, they have a fly, cow which flies in with, so, with the tornadoes. So then they said that there is a, in the movie Twister, I guess it is Twister. They have a, a shot in which a tornado takes away cow. So, so it is named, the cafeteria is named after this. So, I mean, in every, you know, locations, you will see some, you know, imprints of tornadoes because they are, they are so much into the tornadoes. They have, they are seeing tornadoes every year. Uh, 
and uh, so so that was one different experience for me and there is a you know there is a big group actually working on on the predictions of tornadoes in that caps uh, but i am i was not actually involved in tornado predictions i was uh, rather I, I actually involved in uh, global scales as of weather phenomena in the global scale my project was on global scales it was a, a nasa sponsored project so nasa has launched a satellite called uh, aqua satellites where which has aries data in it so they have to see how much this aries can improve the forecast so i was put in that project so that is in a global scale how it is going to improve the uh, forecast and I, I i worked with the global models not with the tornado models but i had to i i, I chat with all these people who are working with uh, tornadoes and all those things uh, so so it it was a really nice experience for me uh, so probably i would like to interject here at the point and and uh, jump back a little bit probably uh, where you where you uh, talk about how how it, it's like a continuing uh, pattern in, in the things that you talk about and we just probably notice this uh, that you say you look at the things in a very very scientific manner like 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 you say that there were tornadoes there were tornadoes for everyone for perhaps right but then you look at them as as someone who's probably so scientifically involved that you say that these were the kind of tornadoes that were happening and there were all these mammoth clouds i'm sorry uh, but i don't know the the, the exact term but then basically you identify the kind of clouds that they were there and you remember those details from such a scientific perspective that it flows in some sense from a from a scientific um, imagination or scientific background that you have so where do you think that this uh, you know took took roots for you in some sense like uh, where do you remember yourself making these kind of detailed uh, investigations in the kind of everyday life that we all see but then we don't make these kind of investigations in the life so how do you remember yourself as that uh that's because i have been trained as an atmospheric scientist from my msc onwards right so i have been learning all these phenomena i see that in the books so i read and i study that in my books and once i see those phenomena which is appearing in the in the real world it's it's really exciting for me i think that is one reason why i don't like abstract things which we cannot see that for i know so th- these things which we learn in the books we can see in the nature also so that's something which is uh, i hope that this is because i learned a lot of course and and i have been working on thinking uh, when you do phd you will think a lot about the systems and all the things so it naturally get ingrained to your thought process okay when you see certain things this you will think in a particular manner but we will not realize it that's all you know subtle it, it is very subtle when you say that say you are you are thinking in a different manner i will realize that, okay i am thinking in a different manner so, but it is already ingrained in me because i have been working on this area for a long period of time so yeah okay so uh, so we would like to talk about the uh, like jump a bit little and and I talk about your current works uh, that that you are pursuing uh, uh, your work on uh, the in- effects or the impacts of data assimilation and uh, with your with your work on ensemble kalman factor as well could you explain uh, how uh, this work exactly um, i mean how do you internalize this work in a sense for you how do you look at it and uh, how would you explain it if if you can for for a for a, a beginning uh, undergraduate or so in, in, in science okay so i have never been exposed to ensemble kalman factor like methods there are two different ways of approaching a data assimilation problem i w- i've been working with what is called you call as minimization problems like variational data assimilation when i was doing my phd but when i got uh, into university of oklahoma national weather center that time they were working with a hybrid method which actually combines the variational approach that's a minimization technique with ensemble kalman factor which got some new good results so uh, there i got experience with both the steps with variational as well as ensemble kalman filter methods and how to combine them optimally so ensemble kalman filter can be used to improve the initial conditions but there is another use of ensemble kalman filter is to understand the predictability of the atmosphere so as i said the model is very sensitive to initial conditions so if you give a model forecast with one initial condition and if you add perturbation to the same initial condition and give another model forecast two will evolve in two different directions so where do we get this perturbations the perturbation should be consistent with the flow of the atmosphere so because we are dealing with a nonlinear dynamical system so we cannot just take some random perturbation and add it so i learned that using ensemble kalman filter system you can generate this perturbations which is consistent with the flow of the atmosphere so that's that's something new for me when i was working with the us then i thought that this can be used for understanding the predictability of the so then i use this ensemble kalman filter system to generate those perturb update that perturbations and this perturbations will be added to the initial condition uh, so let's say i am studying one particular tropical cyclone case so which is forming our bay of bengal let's say our umpun cyclone what i will do is that i'll make uh, 80 or 90 initial conditions by adding perturbations which is generated from ensemble kalman 
Now I will see how it evolves with respect to forecasting, the model forecast. So if it is spreading too much, then that's an indication that that particular moment, you know, that particular time, the, the model is very sensitive to that initial conditions. So in certain other day, if you add the same type of perturbations, the model will not evolve that much. So the, the spread in the in ensemble member or the standard deviation of the ensemble members will not uh, be much large. So then that predictability of the atmosphere is more at that particular time. So in that way, we can you know discuss the predictability of the atmosphere. So ensemble Kalman filter can be used for improving the uh, model initial condition as well as it can be used for this purposes like understanding the predictability system. For example, I'll just give you more details. Let's say uh, I'm trying to forecast a cycle. It starts from Bay of Bengal and one model forecast says that the cyclone is going to land in say Andhra Pradesh. One model forecast says that the cyclone is going to land in Chennai. Another model forecast says that it is going to land in Bengal, West Bengal. So there is huge difference in the ensemble spread. So there is an unpredictability. The predictability is limited. So then I will just take the model forecast and compare what has happened to the one which has gone to Bengal. What are the dynamical changes which has happened, which took the cyclone to the Bengal and what are the dynamical changes which took the cyclone to the Chennai. So then I can really understand what is the underlying dynamics which actually drives the cyclone in different directions. So in this way, I am, I am trying to learn more, you know, in-depth understanding about the phenomenon which is happening in a given region. So I use Ensemble Kalman filter system to generate perturbations or to update perturbations. And using that, I add this perturbation, set of perturbations to the initial conditions. And I will evolve these initial conditions to grow, the errors to grow. And I will see how the errors are growing. And from this, we will we'll gain understanding about the dynamics of the atmosphere. That is exactly I'm working on it right now. Okay. Okay. Quite fascinating. Quite fascinating to hear this because these are the ideas that we never are able to understand because we always uh, like hush away the, the details or put it under the carpet that, okay, there are so many variables that we cannot account for them. And here you are actually literally accounting for them in mathematical ways. So this is something that's extremely fascinating that we wanted to talk about as well. And I think we'll have further questions on that later as well. Yeah, actually you're right in, in the sense that at, the dimensions of atmospheric models are of the order of 10 raised to 7 or so. So it is very difficult to twist every models, twist every variables. And uh, so that's the reason why we are adding perturbations and just doing this. It's a different way of representing the probability density of that, uh, of that weather event. Yeah, sir. And uh, since you're working with Kalman filter, but for a general undergraduate who is not into atmospheric science, Kalman filter is being used in lot of different fields, like from automation to all sort of things. So how is uh, like the Kalman filter applications in atmospheric science? Are they going to be any, there will be any contrast from or any, anything unique to Kalman filter usage in atmospheric science? No, uh, actually there is nothing unique in it. It is the same thing. Only thing is that uh, usually in electrical engineering field and all those things, I've seen Kalman filter, which is mostly, a, you know, a linear, a linearized model, which is being used. But applications may be different for in different areas, but it is the same Kalman filter, which we are using. Uh, in atmospheric science, well, the problem is the multidimensionality. So we are, we are dealing with high dimensional systems. So we cannot use uh, the Kalman filter as such. So we need uh, ensemble Kalman filter. We cannot just represent the probability distribution of the entire system. So instead we are generating, you know, random picks or, or random draws uh, from the population and we make ensembles of it. Because of this high dimensionality, we use ensemble Kalman filter system. Otherwise, I think the Kalman filter system, which is used in electrical engineering, I think it is mostly the same thing. But the purpose, the objectives of using it may be different in different areas. But uh, I don't think atmosphere, atmospheric science, they are going to settle with the uh, ensemble Kalman filter system because uh, Kalman filter system has a lot of issues. One is its linearity and uh, the second one is it's, uh, it assumes the distribution to be Gaussian distribution. So that is one assumption. So those, those assumptions are actually not true for atmospheric science. There will be non-Gaussian distributions as well. So that needs to be incorporated. So the estimations of the initial conditions may not be accurate because of this underlying assumptions like linearity and like uh, assuming that the distribution to be Gaussian. So that, there is a problem. Uh, now uh, the atmospheric science, they are slowly moving on to this towards particle filter, which in fact accounts for the non-Gaussianity of uh, a system as well. But uh, particle filter, it is very difficult to work with high dimensional systems. I am sure that there are a lot of people who are working to find a way out of this. And hopefully in a very few years, this particle filter will get implemented. Okay. 
it's quite interesting to know. Uh, I would like to uh, again a little bit go wider in in the perspective, and I would like to ask you, like in this world changing at such faster pace with newer environmental challenges coming up, in some sense, probably some of them were unforeseen uh, a few decades ago, even. So this has perhaps started to even affect the climate patterns, and in turn, various forces, factors, and variables that one might need to account for while making these elaborate atmospheric models that you've talked about. Uh, for instance, uh, there are so many uh, phenomena that probably did not happen so often in the in the past, and then they have started to get more and more uh, frequent in the, in the recent years. So, how do you see it in a broader perspective in in the long term effects and predictability of the natural phenomenon and climate patterns in general? How do you see uh, addressing your your work or or basically in general the the field of atmospheric sciences addressing that? And do you see it like do you have any future or, or clearer ideas about this? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. So, a few years before, people will make fun of you. Say in two thousand, if you say I am working with weather and climate, but now I think the attitude itself of people are changing. They they understand. They have started seeing the signals of climate change. Previously, there was only predictions. In in terms of the number, there is always an uncertainty. We are not sure in a warming weather the number of cyclones are going to increase. But one thing which is for sure, which is going to happen, is that if the weather is warming, if there is a global warming, and if it exists, this is going to increase the intensity of the cyclone for sure. So in coming years, I think people will start to see more signals about the climate change. I am sure that then people will depend more on the scientific research and scientific conclusions. They will take it more seriously about this because that's something which they really experience. Once people experience. and then you say say that this is the science behind it then they will really understand it. and uh, as far as weather is concerned now you can see in india a lot of weather companies are coming up very recently why because our computational power has actually increased and the weather forecast has become more and more accurate these days so whatever you say like say the weather is not accurate the forecast you say rainfall and there is no rain that is becoming an old story because now it's, it's we have all these big computers we have new artificial intelligence machine learning methods with all this combining all these things your forecast is getting more and more accurate there are a lot of companies which are actually using the weather for for their own purpose for example the power sector companies they require accurate forecast of weather to decide what amount of power they want to generate for the next day or the next day after it so that that's going to save a lot of money for them once the money is involved naturally there will be a lot of companies which comes up actually try to give accurate forecast of the weather and the cyclones uh, are increasing and uh, more weather phenomena are coming up so that's that's producing a lot of destructions so if you can get an accurate track or an accurate intensity of a cyclone then uh, the destructions can be reduced a lot there are also the money is involved that's the fact in which the impact of uh, the significance of weather forecast is actually improving in recent decades i'm i'm sure that in in coming years what is being predicted is that in climate sense that uh, in future due to global warming the extreme weathers are going to be higher so if you say like we have monsoon from uh, june to september so there will be total rainfall which is uh, which is there from june to september they are not saying that the total rainfall is going to change much the, the total rainfall if you look is going to be the same but instead of getting distributed from june to september it will precipitate in pockets like it will have a extreme rainfall uh, at some point of time and other times it, there will be droughts so those kind of situations is something which we are going to see in future so when extreme weather weather events increases the significance of giving accurate forecast is also going to be higher with the rising computational power in the other side and with the new techniques coming up i'm sure that the atmospheric science on weather forecasting has a real future because people started realizing the significance of that so yeah sir and uh, for a general listener uh, can you explain how climate change looks like and how is it caused everyone comes across the term in popular articles but they often do not paint a clear scientific picture can you explain it from a more scientifically informed perspective Uh, actually there is a lot of misconceptions about climate so when so you just go and ask any student say a plus 2 student what is actually causing climate change global warming all of a sudden the immediate thing which is going you are going to get a response from the student okay we are having fossil fuels we are burning fossil fuels and uh, this is actually causing global warming so that answer you can expect for sure i have given talks in many in you know, a school level for, as an outreach program for iast and i got the same answer i was expecting an answer and that that same answer i am getting one thing you need to understand is that climate change is not just because of the human involvement and still it is not very sure how much human involvement has caused the climate one one thing we can say for sure is that of course the anthropogenic involvement or influence is affecting climate but to what extent the anthropogenic influence is changing the climate we are not sure that is a real scientific fact 
Climate change or global warming can also happen due to changes in the natural phenomena that has happened in the past. So past studies, past climatological studies, what they do is that, see, they will break open the ice in the Greenland or Antarctic regions. So ice uh, layers will tell you the stories of different centuries. So air is trapped between that ice layers. From that air and from the compositions, you can gain a lot of understanding about the atmosphere which was prevailing at that point of time. Okay, so past climatological studies, I'm, I'm talking about of the order of one million years. So those studies will show that basically the climate of the earth was never a constant. It just kept on changing. There were warming events, there were cooling events and all these things which kept on happening with respect to the natural changes or natural phenomena uh, which, which is happening so but that's on the scale of you know several thousand years so we now the confusion here is that the one which you are observing here is it because of some naturally uh, induced thing or is it only because of anthropogenic so uh, recent modeling studies has shown that okay anthropogenic uh, has some source human uh, burning of fossil fuels and all this has some influence on the climate but we cannot say that for sure that it is only because of humans so it is basically a, a combination of both and uh, what is actually changing the climate one thing i can tell you for sure is that the amount of radiation which is coming into the earth atmospheric system is from the sun so if that energy uh, which is radiations which is coming from the sun is trapped or blocked due to some reasons the climate is changed that's a one liner for that the one which drives the climate is the balance or imbalance in the radiations which is coming from the sun okay so that's that's something which is, is actually changing the climate yeah. And, uh, and I mean, in this sense, do you think that there is also a long-term effect or, or something of that sort that we can, so basically what people quote or, or what is again made to believe uh, in, in this uh, aspect is that over the last 30 years, we've been seeing more and more extreme climates in some sense. And then there are always newer and newer records being set in the climates or weather each season and so on. So I think that is one of the main uh, ideas or ideologies that's given to, to support the fact that we are causing it and so on and so forth. And I believe there is, of course, uh, some aspect of it uh, which we contribute to. But how how much do you think is the whole natural system sensitive to our perturbations in some? Or uh, do you think that there is something that is okay. actually going to change change at at probably? Uh, I cannot give a scientific uh, answer for that because that is not still clear how much it is how much humans are contributing. But let me reiterate: I have, I have not said that humans are not causing climate change. I am not Trump <laughs> to say that it is humans has no role in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am saying that how much uh, human is contributing, we are not sure. But uh, looking at the time scales with which the changes has happened, it is in a few decades we are seeing this, such a change. I am sure that uh, humans are actually pretty much involved in uh, in the change in this the current phenomenon that's occurring over here. So even if you reduce the fossil fuel emission, uh, so this will not immediately settle down. It will take a lot of time for the climate system to bring it back to the even every natural phenomenon can happen. Say, a Mount Pinatubo, which is in Philippines, has uh, erupted. Volcanic eruption has happened. So this has sent out a lot of uh, dust or, or uh, sulfur uh, ashes to the air, into the atmosphere. So this has blocked uh, the incoming solar radiations, which is coming into the earth. Uh, so this has actually affected the climate system of the earth. Uh, for example, monsoons, which is happening every year, we observe it. What is what is driving the monsoon? The driving factor is the land sea temperature contrast. It's like a you know large scale sea breeze. So when the Mount Pinatubo erupted, when it blocked uh, the sunlight coming in the radiations which is reaching the earth has reduced. So this has actually reduced the temperature contrast. This has actually weakened the monsoons for few years. So once the ashes got settled down, it was returned back to the normal. It took several years to, to get it back to the normal. So I am saying that just an eruption can in fact set a you know, imbalance to the uh, radiations, which can in fact affect the climate of the climate system. So even small perturbations can in fact produce a lot of changes in their uh, so that's natural. That's not a, you know, uh, you know, it's a, it's a human induced thing, but it is reversible. So such things can in fact influence the, uh, you know, climate system. So I, I cannot just say that for sure, how much humans has influenced, but uh, looking at the time scales, human has, well, will have a significant influence on the climate change. Uh, uh, so, so we come across many misconceptions about the field of atmospheric science uh, and the details that go into kind of complex research that is pursued. Uh, would you like to talk about any of these from your experience? Okay, so misconceptions, uh, I will, I'll tell you because that's, that's something the question which I face every time is uh, in about this weather. When we talk about weather, 
hey, why can't you get uh, the weather forecast very accurate? So US and Europe, they will just simply look at the weather forecast for today and they'll, they'll just go. They'll carry umbrella if the rain is forecast or otherwise not. So snow is forecast, so snow will, snow will be there. So why is it not happening here? Is it because we are lacking something? So what I experience is that people ask this question, they don't listen to the answer. They already have this understanding in their mind, a preconceived notion that, okay, India, we have less uh, people who are actually working on it or the less, uh, they don't have that much exports, which they are having. But actually that is not true. That is not, that's a, a, a common misconception. It's because we are, we are not getting our forecast right. It's because we are over the tropical regions and they are over the middle latitude region. Suppose we are uh, during the uh, era of Pangea when the, uh, when the continents were floating, Suppose we have been pushed further north of the latitude and suppose we had the same technologies what we had or same same models which we have before and now our India is further moved to the north. We could have, we could get a very accurate forecast. So it is not about the technologies, it's not about the computation. It is about the weather systems in the middle latitude is, is diff different from that in the tropical regions. So tropical regions, we have a lot of convection. Convections are uh, something which is a gray area. The physics of convections is still to be revealed. Act, very active research is going on in convections. So tropical regions, there is mostly driven, the weather systems are mostly driven by convections that cannot be well represented in the models. So that's the region why the forecast over tropical regions, wherever it is, it is in uh, India or in African regions, predicting such phenomena are very difficult. And in, even in US or mid latitude countries, predicting the summer weather is more difficult than winter weather because uh, the sort of convections is usually associated. There also there is convection. I'm not saying that there is no convection. So convection is embedded in large scale systems. So models can easily predict that, but uh, small scale convections are very difficult to predict. So that's the reason why we are struggling. So, but it's still improving, but it, it won't be that accurate as what we are having in the US because of the difference in the weather systems, the dynamics of the weather systems, which is happening in middle latitude. In the That's one common misconceptions which I hear. I, I purposefully are, wanted you to ask this question because this is something which I face a lot. <laughs> Even when I started, even from a started my PhD, okay, which area you're working on atmospheric science? Okay, why, why the weather forecast is not very accurate here? What is lacking in India? So, so, so those sort of questions I kept hearing. <laughs> That's true. That's that's so true, sir. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, I think there is this one question that I want to follow up with this here. That you're working on again, uh, the atmospheric modeling and and all these ideas that you've mentioned to us. It's been extremely interesting to hear about them. But I just wanted to know in long term. Probably it's a very, very naive outtake uh, from someone who's from outside the field of thought. So is it something that you're trying to converge to a weather model that can predict all the time the correct things? Is, is it something like you're converging or you want to converge to one model which encapsulates everything in a proper manner? Or is it something that is always going to have multiple dimensions that one can control? So basically multiple models that one can, one can use. Is it something of that? Actually, I mean, however accurate the models which we, we get, suppose if you, if, if you have a, if God appears before you and give you a weather model, which is perfect in all sense, you will not uh, be able to give an accurate forecast because of the chaotic nature of the atmosphere. That we cannot change. We have no control over it. So the, even then, even if you have a perfect model also, you will start getting uh, you know, false alarms every time. That's because of the very nature of the atmosphere is chaotic or else the God has to change the atmosphere and say, make it more predictable. Like, just like the movement of planets. It's very easy to forecast, right? So if you know the physics, it's very easy to forecast, but this is a nonlinear dynamic system, which is actually very difficult to capture it. So that's the beauty of it. Actually, that, that is where the beauty lies. You know, the uncertainty and try to predict it is, is actually where the beauty lies. In. I think it will get it, the forecast of the model improves with respect to time, but will you get a perfect model in the future? I am very doubtful about it. So if you ask me about my future work, I will be working on this to continue working on with this, you know, understanding the dynamics of the system. At the same time, since being in ISRO, I am just trying to uh, map the experience which I've gained from here into the planets like Mars and all, where predictability problems have a lot of scope for it. So now we started getting the atmospheric models for Mars as well. There are a lot of agencies uh, from West as well as in the East. They are releasing the models for Mars and all those things. So even they have the data simulation systems and all. I have not really started working on it, but in future, I'm thinking to contribute a bit towards the planetary atmospheres as well. Uh, sir, when you said you have models for other planets, one thing I don't understand is why should there be a different model? The governor, governing equations are same in both the planets. So why exactly. is it a big That's thing a very, to get a very, a very good model? question. 
the governing equations are the same. I, it's true, only that uh, you know the certain parameters needs to be changed. But the model is not just of governing equations. The model has a lot of approximation. It needs to include a lot of parameterization schemes as well. So the parameterization schemes are not absolute or not universal. That needs to be changed with respect to different you know planets depending upon the situations over there. And you have to, of course, you have to make some you know uh, changes for Martian atmosphere as compared to the Earth atmosphere. Plus, uh, say if you if you talk particularly about Martian atmosphere, we don't have to include so much of moist soil processes. The moisture is less, so moisture related aspects can be you know reduced, effects can be taken away from the model, or it, uh, the the contribution of such effects can be reduced from the model. So I mean, you have to make uh, serious changes. I mean, you cannot simply plug in the atmospheric model to Mars. So you have to understand that phenomenon which is relevant over there, and then you have to make. Uh, changes according so uh, the relevance of studying mars particularly why i'm saying is that so mars is usually governed by the, all those dust storms uh, dust storms will actually it will block the solar radiations if there are dust storms uh, say so we're sending a lander pop in the future and it will have solar panels in with it so if there are dust storms it will actually reduce the amount of radiations which the solar panels are receiving so if you can just use these models to give an accurate forecast about when and where the dust storms can happen they can adjust uh, you know the systems accordingly this is something which i am looking forward i mean this this kind of things can be knowledge of this predictability of martian atmosphere can be used for future space programs so that's 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 the context at which i am started thinking about okay i slowly started moving towards it uh, but I am still a student in that. I started, started learning, uh, reading and all those things. It's still you know, happening. Okay. Okay. Uh, really, really interesting bits. Uh, but yes, I mean, I, I, I believe on a concluding note, if you would like to add something that you had and probably we did not discuss, you can uh, answer that. Okay. I mean, let me talk about one final word about climate change. So ancient Mayans actually believe that there is a saying that tombs are sent by gods if they did something wrong. But uh, I can see a correlation between what ancient Mayans believe to the current situation. In this world of scientific knowledge, I would say that it is not the God. It's basically the nature which punishes us for all our deeds. So we are actually, without understanding the nature, without caring for the nature, we are polluting the nature. And the furies of the nature which we are seeing is because the nature is punishing us for our bad deeds. So we have not traveled far from Mayan era to this, this current era. So Mayans uh, believe that it is God, but now it is. we know that it is not the God, it is the nature who is, uh, who is punishing us for our bad deeds. So we have to care about our nature for our for our own well being. This was zeroing in with Dr. Govindan Koti Mohan Kumar. It has been brought to you by the Sounding Rocket in collaboration with the IIST Alumni Association from the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. We extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Govindan Koti for sharing instances from his wonderful journey and ideas on various aspects of research in the field of atmospheric sciences, the understanding of climate and weather patterns, and how a complex field is dealt with in its entirety. On behalf of the Zeroing In team, which included Fenil Shah, Shreya Mishra, Manish Chauhan, Prajwal Patnayak, KVNG Vikram, and I am Naman Jain. Thanks a lot for listening to this episode. If you have any suggestions, you can write to us on zeroingin and outlook.in or contact and follow us on our Instagram handle at Zeroing In Podcast or the Sound and Rocket page on Facebook.